Thank you, Pastor Bill. And uh, a huge welcome as well to you from me if you are our guest here this morning. I think I spoke to 21 new people last week. So exciting. It's really cool. And thanks to our young people for all your effort and help in Nick and Alice and Jake for championing that. But I've got Chelsea, one of our youth, sitting down the front helping manage our service today. How good is that? Thanks, Chelsea. It's really cool. Um, <clears throat> What on earth am I here for? I'm so excited about this message today because uh, I think it's going to really be a game changer for so many of us. Do you know, I was retelling the story about how Michael and I met to our kids, how we uh, first got to know each other, how we, uh, how God brought us together, how we went out on some get to know you uh, coffees <laughs> and how God worked and then how we got married. And Angus was about three at the time, my younger son, and he, I remember him saying, was I born yet? <laughs> Just like <laughs> trying to understand, hang on, where do I fit in this whole picture, mum? Like you're talking about this, but what about me? And I was straight away I said, do you know what? Only Jesus knew about you. Only Jesus knew about you. And it's true. It's good to sometimes just to remind ourselves and to be reminded that actually before we were born, God planned us. He, he longed for us. He knew about us. And so on your seats, there's some message notes. If you need a pen right now, you can let Chris and Em and our ushers uh, know and they will run to you a pen. Put up your hand if you need one, because like I said last week, if you didn't get to come along, uh, as we are filling in these notes, uh, it's actually helping us remember things. It's not homework, but it's actually, you can write more than just the blanks, fill in the blanks. You can actually write down other things as you're going along. But this is a great way for us to reinforce what God's speaking to our, about us today and to have an open, uh, ready heart to hear what it is that He's going to say. Last week I shared on this passage, and here it is in a slightly different version. Uh, in Ephesians 1 4, it says, Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. Only Jesus knew about you. But how good is that? that before he even created the world, he loved us and chose us in Christ. In, and Rick Rowan, one of the quotes in the book uh, that uh, many of us have been reading, on page 26, he says, You are not an accident. Your birth was no mistake or mishap, and your life is no fluke of nature. Your parents may not have planned you, but God did. He was not at all surprised by your birth. In fact, He expected it. Long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. That's pretty hard to get our minds around, right? But it's true. He thought of you first. It is not fate, nor chance, nor luck, nor coincidence that you're breathing at this very moment. You are alive because God wanted to create you. That's amazing. That's stunning. In the message paraphrase of that Ephesians 1 passage, it says, Long before he laid down the earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ and what pleasure he took in planning this. So beautiful. And last weekend was the big overarching uh, introduction and launch of what on earth am I here for? And the reality we talked about was that God has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And over the next five weeks, we're going to drill down on each of the five purposes that God has for each one of us and what that looks like to actually live it out, to actually express those five purposes in your own individual life with passion, with clarity, and most importantly, with God's help, because we need His help. So the five purposes we're going to look at, and our life groups will also look at each of these themes, uh, one per week for the coming five weeks are, you were made for God's pleasure, you were formed for His family, you were created to become like Christ, you were shaped to serve God, and you were made for a mission. And on our uh, bookmarks, that if you don't have one, you can collect one from one of our ushers at the door, it's got the list of those five purposes uh, plus the, the first week's theme and memory verse and memory verses for each of those weeks. But I want to know who can remember last week's memory verse. Don't put it up, Declan. 
Phil, I'm not going to ask you. Come on. There's a prize involved. Who can remember it? Who can say it out loud? Oh, my goodness, you guys. Come on. Who's going to be brave? No one. Oh, Carmel. Do you remember it? Okay. Here we go. No, I can't tell. Next week, you can remember next week's. Anyone? Good, good. Get, forgetting the ball rolling, though, Carmel. Now we're all confident. I'm coming over this side and I'm hoping that there's someone over here who's going to. Jean Zubas! Here we go. Here we go. There's a free Jesus the Game Changer DVD coming your way, Jean. A whole series. Here we go. I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. And the reference? Isaiah 44, verse 38. Yes! There you go. All right, so you know what's coming next week. If you remember the memory verse, you might be getting a prize, which would be pretty good. That's an awesome series, Jesus the Game Changer. There's some sessions we didn't watch last week in there, Jean, so enjoy that. Today we're going to dig into the first purpose and the first calling that God has on our lives, which is, get ready to write it down. The first purpose of my life is to be loved by God. Yes, that's exactly right. The first purpose of my life is to be loved by God. In Jude 1, 1, it says, This letter is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to all who are called to live in the love of God. Who are called to live in the love of God the Father and in the care of Jesus Christ. You and I are called to live in the love of God. What a beautiful, beautiful Imagery, picture, truth, reality. We're called to live in the love of God. We don't need to ask permission to dip our toes in the water's edge and sort of wonder and hope what is God's love like. No, we are called (laughs) to be forever found in the vast ocean of His love and care. And that's what happens when we give our lives to Christ. We live in the love of God. We're in the care of Jesus Christ. Whether we feel it or not, that's the new reality of what has happened because the old is gone and the new has come. And so what we actually need is a continual and ever-deepening revelation. And I've been praying this morning that the Holy Spirit will bring revelation (laughs) of how great and how big God's love for us really is. How great and how big God's love for us really is. This amazing love of God is meant to be lived in. To live in it means to receive it, to enjoy it, and to experience it, to accept it as something that is real and true for us, to receive it for ourselves. To experience it means to cherish it, to plumb the depths of God's great love for us. We're meant to marvel at it. We're meant to relish and delight in it to rest in it, to draw strength and hope from it, to build our lives upon it and to give ourselves completely to God because he's laid down his life for us. Do you know there's this guy called Pat Barrett who has written a couple of the songs that we sing and love as part of our church family, Good Good Father and Build My Life. And uh, he, uh, there's a recording of him, you can find it on YouTube, it's called This Love. Pat Barrett, this love, Pat Barrett. And it's just him spontaneously starting to sing out a prayer, really, a prayer that's in his heart. Uh, And it's beautiful because it's about getting to know and living in this love, this amazing love, this love of God. And so I just want to read to you some of the lyrics from that because you might want to go home this afternoon, put it on, close your eyes and just allow God to remind you that this love is an everyday kind of love. It's not ordinary, it's extraordinary. But it's meant to be lived in, not just on Sundays, but every day. Have a listen to these words. Oh, just to know you, to really taste and see, to really walk with you every moment, every day. To be with you, to have my eyes open, to see you, to have my heart open, to know you, Every day, every day, 
This love is an everyday kind of love. Every morning I'm in it. This love is an everyday kind of love. Every evening I'm in it. And this love doesn't leave me all alone and never forgets its own. This love won't leave me because my past is bad. Oh, and this love lifts me above the waves. I don't need to be overwhelmed. It always raises me upon the rock so my feet can finally stand on solid ground. It's every moment, every day, always, 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 always. This love is an everyday kind of love. Every morning I'm in it. This love is an everyday kind of love. Every evening I'm in it. Do you know the first purpose of my life and your life is to be loved by God? It means my first calling, your first calling, is to be his son or his daughter. He has called me to be in relationship with him, to know him, to spend time with him, to talk and listen to him, to walk with him and to imitate him. In 1 John 3, 1, it says, What an incredible quality of love the Father has shown us that we should be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. To be named and called and counted. Do you know, Michael and I picked out our boys' names on purpose. We, it was an honour to bestow a name on them. Callan means mighty warrior. Samuel, his second name means asked for. Angus means possessing unique strength. James was Jesus' brother and a leader in the early church. We chose those names. We bestowed those names on him, on them on purpose. As we felt God inspire us with those names. God has named you son. If you're in Christ, God has named you. God names you daughter. That's what he's bestowed upon you, what he's given you. That's how he sees you. That's how he wants to relate to you. Do you know, um, he's called us son and daughter. When I call my son's names, it's out of, usually, (laughs) out of affection and warmth and relationship. You don't ever use your first and your second child's name as a way of getting their attention, do you? Callan Samuel Tombage. (laughs) Never. (laughs) But God doesn't do that. He calls our names. He, he calls and that's out of an affection and a warmth and relationship that he says, Diane, you're my daughter. You're my daughter. You know, to be counted is to, to, to belong to something. And so when I introduce my boys to others, I'll say, this is my son, Callan. This is my son, Angus. And that's what God says about you. This is my son, Nathan. This is my daughter, Tanya. This is my son, Jamie. God names and calls and counts us, his sons and his daughters. That is so beautiful. Each one of us is called to be loved by him and God's love for you is so, so, so great. Oh, how he loves you. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays a prayer and this is something that you can make a personal prayer for you. If you struggle with understanding the love of God, you can actually pray this prayer, insert yourself into this prayer. Paul says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots, the things that your faith by trusting in God's love, they're like roots that nourish you, that sustain your life and your faith. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvellous love. In the NIV, it says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. You know, we need deep roots and strong foundations. And it's based on God's love for us. Deep roots and strong foundations. We need to live a life that's built on his love for us and we need Deep roots, our faith going deep into the reality of God's love for us. Continually be sustained by it, be, give, be given life by it. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvellous love and may you have the power to understand, this is by revelation, by the Holy Spirit's help, as all God's people should. And now he's not saying 
Get it together, Cass. Why can't you just understand the love of God? He's saying, this is your birthright and your inheritance as a daughter and a son of God. You are not meant to just give, you know, uh, tip your hat to the idea of God's love. You're meant to experience it. And that's something you can long for and pray for, that you would experience the love of God. Then it goes on to say, and know how wide and how long and how high and how deep His love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great, you'll never fully understand it. You can put yourself in that prayer. I pray that, Jesus, you'll be more and more at home in my heart as I trust in you. May the roots of my life go down deep into the soil of your love. You can start to pray that as a personal prayer of your life. Particularly if you've had a family situation where you didn't really experience the love of God very often. Do you know, When you think of God's love for you, think of a cross. Because that's the ultimate demonstration of his love for you. That's actually how you can know time and time again that he loves you. It's a cross. Can we put that picture up, Declan? It's good. (laughs) We've got a soundtrack happening, come on. A cross, I just want you to leave that out because the cro- God's love is demonstrated by a cross and God's love is wide enough to be everywhere. God, in Romans 5 it says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. This is how he proved it, how he showed it, how he personified it. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to read that again. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the power of Christ's forgiveness can penetrate the darkest hearts and the darkest and the most vilest environments on this earth, including your heart and including mine. Christ came into this world to save sinners. And if you think you're not a sinner or you are offended by the idea of being a sinner, do you know what sin is? Sin is actually trying to run your life without God. That's what sin is. And so none of us can say or claim honestly that we've never sinned. All of us fall short of God's perfect and good standards for our lives. All of us are needing a saviour. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is wide enough. When you see a cross, those arms outstretched, it's wide enough for everyone, everywhere, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. Jesus Christ took the punishment and took God's anger at your sin, at your independence from Him on that cross. He took it upon Himself. He became sin for us so that we could have a perfect relationship with Him so that we could have eternity with Him, so that He could bring us into His presence forever because we've put our trust and faith in Him, so that we could know God as our Heavenly Father and be holy and without fault in His eyes because of Jesus' blood that was shed and His forgiveness that is available for anyone, everywhere. God's love is wide enough to be everywhere. It's also long enough to last forever. In Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, it says in the message paraphrase, everyone has to die once, then face the consequences. But Christ's death was also a one-time event, but it was a sacrifice that took care of sins forever, forever. If you've received Christ's forgiveness, it's applied to your life, your past, your present, your future sins forever. God's love is long enough to last forever. He's not going to bring up your sins and point the finger at you. He's forgiven you. God's love is wide enough to be everywhere. It's long enough to last forever. It's deep enough to handle anything. It's deep enough to handle anything. In Romans 8, it says in the message paraphrase, verse 35 and 39, do you think anything is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. 
absolutely nothing. Some of you need to hear that this morning. You're facing pain, you're facing sickness, maybe you're going through grief, maybe there's an entrenched family situation that's happening. Do you know, maybe it's grief or brokenness. Jesus' grace is sufficient and His comfort knows no end. Many of us have been the experience have experienced his comfort. If you've experienced his comfort through hard times, could you just raise your hands? Hi, we're not ashamed of it. Look around this room, so many people. On the cross, Jesus not only identified with our pain and suffering, he fully embraced it because he fully embraced us in our humanity. His love is deep in us to handle anything. You know, for the worst what if that you can imagine, his love for you is deeper still. There's people in this room who have proved that time and time again in their own life. The worst, what if? Maybe you're facing one of them right now. You're in the thick of it. God's love for you is deeper still. His love for you is faithful. His love for you won't quit. His love for you won't let you down. It's what you can stake your life on. It's true. It's consistent. It's unchanging. If you're facing something right now, it doesn't mean that God is punishing you or he's angry at you. He knows what you're going through and he wants and has promised he will be a very present help to you. Even if some of the things you're facing are from your own choices, some of them may be at no fault of your own. But right now in your time of need, if you ask for his help, he will be, he promises to be a very present help a very present help to you. And our advocate, our counsellor, our comforter, the Holy Spirit is here this morning reminding us and urging us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because he is the demonstration of God's love for you. God's love is wide enough to be everywhere and for anyone It's long enough to last forever. It's deep enough to handle anything. That's a picture of a cross, right? But it's also high enough to overlook our mistakes. Through his death on the cross, Jesus bridged the gap between us and a holy God. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus magnificently reassures us. He has done what we could never do. He has done what we could never do. He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And instead of counting our sins, faults and mistakes against us, he did what we could never do. He opened up a new and living way to God. He has removed every barrier so you can know God as your heavenly father. And nothing and no one could keep Jesus in the grave. Praise God. And now his resurrection power comes to live. That same power that raised him from the dead comes to live inside us as we put our trust in him. God's love is wide enough to be anywhere for anyone. (laughs) It's long enough to last forever. It reaches behind us for our past sins applies to us in our present and covers us in our future. It's deep enough to handle anything and high enough to overlook our mistakes because Christ paid for the penalty for them. It's marvellous. God's love is marvellous. It's so wonderful. You're allowed to say amen to that. Are you sitting here just being blown away again and again by his love for you? Well, maybe if there's a bit of a block or you haven't experienced it, this is going to be helpful for you because how do we, how do we experience the love of God? We talked about what it is. How do we experience it? Do you know, we receive and we believe. You might want to, Write those thoughts down. We receive and we believe. In John 1, 12, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now we know that verse applies to anyone and everyone who has never given their life to Jesus. And it's true for you today. If you're here, if you've never given your life to Christ, that verse is for you. If you receive him, 
If you believe upon him, you will become a child of God. That can happen for you today. But do you know, just before John 1, 12, in two verses, it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. And it also says, He came to that to which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And so there, has, there also is, I feel like the Holy Spirit's applying this verse to our, all of our hearts, whether we're on the journey to faith or whether we've been Christians for 40 years here today. We have to continually receive and believe in God's love. <laughs> we can't just expect fuzzy feelings to pop out of the sky. We actually have to receive and rest in what Christ has done for us on the cross. And we have to continually put our trust and believe in what he says and who he is. That's what faith is. And so receive and believe is not just if you're on the journey to faith and you're going to receive him today. It's for all of us. Do you know, it's like almost like a child when a child is distressed or a child is upset and a parent's coming in and they're saying, I'm here. You know who I am? I'm trying to help you listen to me. And they're not listening. And they're resisting and they're fighting and they're flailing around and then just will not. But the parent is standing there and they're saying, you know, it's mum. It's okay. You can trust me. This is going to be all right. But the, the child's flailing around. It's like what we're doing when we're not receiving and believing. It's like we're, we're fighting, we're, we're, we're resisting, we're saying, you know what? That's good. God's love is for Jill or God's love is for Pastor Alan, but it's not for me. We're resisting his help. Instead of receiving it, taking it and saying, God, I need your love. I need to rest in your love. I need to stake my life upon your love because without it, there's no hope. But I place my, I receive it again. I receive it afresh. I place my hope. I put my trust in who you are. I put my trust in what you've done. And as we do that, some of those warm fuzzies and and we can experience a manifest presence of God. I'm not denying that. But as we do that, we actually grow in our experience of the love of God because we make it our own. We apply it and take it and become something that's true for us because receive means to actively lay hold of, to take and to accept what is offered and available to us. You know, God's love could be standing there and, and we just say, That's good, that's good, but don't receive it. We have to receive it. We have to personally take what's offered and available to us. And we have to believe. To believe means to affirm, to place confidence in, to entrust ourselves because we know that the one who says it is trustworthy. To believe, to put our trust. When you receive Christ, you are letting him love you. You are coming under his care and asking him to lead your life from now on. When you believe in his name, you are choosing to build your life on his love for you. But also, to receive and believe is how you keep on experiencing God's love for you. Every time you receive and rest in Christ's saving work on your behalf, you are letting him love you. Every time you believe and agree with who he is and what he says, you are choosing to build your life on his love for you. I'm going to say that again. You might want to write it down. Every time you receive and rest in Christ's saving work on your behalf, you are letting him love you. And every time you believe and agree with who he is and what he says, you're choosing to build your life on his love for you. Don't wait for the warm, fuzzy feelings. (laughs) Receive and believe by faith and your awareness of his and experience of his love in your life will grow. So what happens when I let God love me like that, when I receive and believe? What happens is acceptance rather than shame. In Romans 5.1, it says, By faith we have, have been made acceptable to God. And now because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. 
To receive that truth is saying something like this, God, I receive your love. (laughs) I thank you that I've already been made acceptable to you. I rest in the truth that Jesus has done what I could never do. And now that I can live for you, I can live in your love. I'm at peace with you. I thank you that I'm at peace with you. You start praying that prayers like that, the truth like that, and your experience of God's love will grow. Romans 8, 33 to 34 says, If God says his chosen ones are acceptable to him, can anyone bring charges against them or can anyone condemn them? No, indeed. <laughs> to believe that verse, that God says, I'm ex- you say I'm acceptable to you. I, res- I believe that. I stake my life on that. Lord, I don't feel acceptable, but you say I am. Because Jesus, you've already paid the price. You've already done what's necessary. And so no one can bring charges against me and condemn me. So shame, you get lost. I kick you off my life you're not having a part in my life anymore because Jesus loves me believe and receive when I let God love me acceptance rather than shame and then there's boldness in bringing my needs to my heavenly dad boldness you know Romans 8 14 to 15 says all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God So you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. To receive that is to say, God, thank you. Your spirit lives in me. You're my Father. I pray to you. Thank you, God, that you're my Father. I thank you that fear has no place in my life. I just take authority over it now and I kick it out of here because I'm not going to be afraid. You are my father. You know the needs before I bring them to you. I'm your child. I trust you. Receive. Believe. Hebrews 4.16 says, Then let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Father, I'm coming to you because I believe what you say. You say I can come to your throne of grace with confidence. I come to you now because I really need your help. Dad, this is happening. It's totally hard. It sucks. I hate it. I need your help. God, believe. It's exercising faith and accepting the reality of God's love. What happens when I build my life on God's love? Do you know there's peace that I don't understand? When our son Angus was born, um, he turned blue um, twice. (laughs) They put him on respirator and then brought him back to me and then he turned blue again and Then they hit a button and you could literally hear about 12 people, medical people running. Running. (laughs) Turn your nose. (laughs) And they took him away to uh, the special care unit and put him in a respiratory tank or whatever that thing's called. I don't know. Dave, tell me later. Um, But all, all that happened is we knew our baby got taken away and we're left in a room with all these medical people. Whoop, off they go. And we're like, okay. But I tell you, the peace of God was so strong. We just turned to each other and went, all right, we're going to pray because what else can we do? (laughs) Jesus, we thank you for this little boy. We thank you that he's in your hands. We thank you that you're going to look after him. We thank you that you, it's a miracle that he's born and now he's in your care and we trust you. We just started to pray and the peace of God in that room guarded our hearts and our mind in Jesus and was such an amazing experience. I'll never forget it. Peace, I don't understand. In Philippians 4, verses 5 to 7, it says, The Lord is near. Do not, be, <clears throat> do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything. So you can tell God you're anxious and worried. Just don't sit it in your mind for hours. Now, I'm not talking about uh, a medical diagnosis of or clinical anxiety, okay? Because for those situations, sometimes you actually need to get some medical professional help, Okay? When I'm talking about general rule of the mill everyday circumstances where we can be anxious about something. We can talk to God about those things. And then as Pastor Bill's told us before, in, in everything, every circumstance and situation, we can pray about it. God, I'm anxious about this. Don't deny it. Just tell him, God, I'm anxious about this right now. But I thank you that you're in control and I ask for your help right now. And now I thank you. I ask for your help in this specific way. It says... 
continuing to make your specific requests to God. I ask for your help in this way. And now, God, I'm thanking you with thanksgiving that your answer is on the way. And what happens? Peace comes. And the peace of God, that peace, this is beautiful, that peace which reassures the heart, that peace which transcends all understanding, that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. What happens when I build my life on God's love, peace, I don't understand. There's also courage to respond with faith. Courage to respond with faith. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. You know, there might be some things that you're holding off, taking a step of faith because you're worried about who won't like it, um, who might get angry at you, (laughs) what will happen if it fails, all those sorts of things. But when there is an awareness of God's love and we build our lives upon his love, we're able to take steps of faith, steps that feel risky because we know that even if we fall flat on our face, God will still love us. How good is that? And the last thing is what happens when I build my life on God love for me is there's worship instead of worry worship instead of worry and there's a verse in Matthew who talks about don't worry about having enough 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 (laughs) and then it says today's trouble is enough (laughs) at the end of that verse but if God's love is wide enough to be everywhere and long enough to be forever to last forever and deep enough to handle anything and high enough to overlook mistakes, let me tell you, it's also strong enough to help you with today's trouble. It's strong enough to help you with today's trouble. To receive and rest in his death and resurrection on your behalf and believe in who he says and what he's done. To willingly do what he asks of you because you long to delight his heart. That is worship. That's a posture of trust and devotion that's bowing down in your heart. And I'm going to take my shoes off to teach you the memory verse today because I want you to remember this. Some of you might go home and do this on your own with God or lay down on your face before him. But a posture of worship is this. And today's memory verse is give yourselves completely to God for you have been given new life. And after hearing all that I've said about God's love, We can't help but want to respond and say, my whole life, God, is yours. I want to live in your love 